out of your food coma. Um, I'm talking about refactoring the Linux kernel or digging in dust. Uh, that's something I was doing for the last couple of years in several areas of the kernel. Uh, why? The motivation for that is A, I'm trying to get the uh, real-time patches into the mainline kernel. And a lot of the things uh, we have to do in the real-time patches is actually to work around shortcomings of the mainline code base. And the other part of the motivation, I'm annoyed of that crap. If you have to dig into stuff which just doesn't make sense and you have to do that for 10 years in a row, you really get annoyed. So one of my pet peeves, uh, what I want to talk about now is uh, the CPU hot plug infrastructure. It was added in 2002. Um, so some guy named Rusty Russell came up with the brilliant idea, just let's use a notifier to make this universal and then let do all the, call, uh, the, the implementations of the notifiers something. So that was, uh, at that point of time, it was okay because it was exactly one callback and five users. So it was actually, you were able to figure it out. Uh, when we really tackled that stuff, we were, there were hundreds of users and a lot of things which got really, really not understandable. So one of the, the first things, magic and uninstrumentable locking. So the locking of the hot plug infrastructure basically evaded locked app by an annotation trick. So you could take the lock, uh, the, the hot plug locks basically everywhere without locked app ever complaining to you. That's nice. Your code must be perfect. There's no deadlocks on the horizon because locked app never complains about them. That turned out to be not true. Then the code has interesting ordering requirements. So there was a, file, a header file where you had about 10 constants or 10 defines for which uh, defined notifier callback priorities. And those were actually documented. Then you went through uh, the actual implementations in a lot of places. And some of them just had random numbers assigned to, to um, make their call more prior, uh, with a higher priority than the other. But uh, this was nowhere documented. The other very non-obvious ordering was just linker ordering. So we tripped over that when we converted it because we changed the order and th things fell, fell apart. And we wondered why does it fall apart and we figured out, oh, because the linker happens to uh, order the init functions differently than we did. Um, one other thing which always annoyed me about that hot block stuff and the notifiers in general is how they handle startup and teardown. So you register notifiers and they get sorted by priority. Nice. And then startup, you have highest priority first, lowest priority last, and then teardown, you do the same thing, which doesn't make sense. Because if you pile up and you want to go down, uh, you probably should go in the opposite direction, but no, it go, goes up again in the same priority order. So stuff which needed really to be symmetric in terms of teardown and startup had actually two notifiers. There was no debugging in there, so you couldn't for the hell figure out what that stuff was doing. Uh, interestingly, it was known to be fragile for a very, very long time. And all people did is instead of tackling it, they just applied duct tape and more duct tape and more duct tape. Uh, and 
all the duct tape layers fell completely apart when we uh, did hot plug in RT. So it, I think uh, it took us 10 years to get to a point where you can actually use it. Uh, I had a first step on that in 2012 um, where I thought what we really want to do is to have a state machine with explicit states, a state array where you can express ordering requirements and make it symmetric. So the teardown order is the opposite of the startup order, which makes the most sense. Uh, I had a proof of concept patch which converted some of the notifiers and uh, it looked pretty good. But then I ran out of spare time and some unnamed corporation promised to pick it up. But instead they went and applied more duct tape. So, uh, in two th end of 2015, uh, when we got funding for the real-time project, uh, it was one of the first things we really uh, tackled, um, revisiting the CPU hot plug stuff. It took us almost two years uh, to get it done. I come to that time span a little bit later. What do we have to do? is uh, a lot of groundwork. We had to go through all notifiers and document the ordering requirements. While doing that and looking at the implementation of the notifiers, we fixed several dozen of existing bugs. There were resource leaks, memory leaks, um, null pointer uh, problems, a lot of interesting things because all that stuff could not be tested properly. So most of the error code passes were never, never executed because there was no, no way to do that really uh, in an automated fashion. And that's what, um, what's interesting about the symmetric state machine is because if you do a startup to a certain point and then you get a failure, you tear down everything but you use for the teardown, you actually use the regular teardown path as well. So you do not have a separate teardown when startup failed path. You have a regular teardown path and a regular startup path. So and, then, and for the, in, the, in the old notifier-based uh, version, there were different notifier reasons. One was prepare, prepare failed, up, down, down, failed, and every other notifier uh, callback implementation had a different way of handling it and differently broken. So there was really a lot of existing bugs there. Um, that was interesting. Once we had figured that out, so we knew about the ordering requirements and all these kind of things, we really went to the grunt work, which was basically converting all the notifier implementations to explicit hot plug states. And uh, on the way, we gradually removed the old infrastructure because some of the states became obsolete after a while. So we ha could remove them, or, or the, the notifier reasons became obsolete, so we could remove them and the associated infrastructure. And at the very end, we got rid of the notifiers at all. So that was part one of it, and then we tackled the locking problem. So um, we wanted to get rid of that interesting recursive and uninstrumentable lock and just use a proper reader writer semaphore for it, a per CPU reader writer semaphore, because a lot of code um, nowadays wants to uh, prevent CPU hot plug in hot in hot code paths, so you don't want to do something which uh, uh, wax around on a global reader writer lock. So we use uh, the per CPU reader writer semaphores, which are probably covered by LockDAP and non-recursive. And so we spent a couple of months to solve all the related problems. Um, there was really 
about 25 um, real existing deadlocks lurking where uh, lock order dependencies were not visible. Uh, it was probably hard to trigger, but occasionally, uh, especially in the RT kernel, we managed to trigger them on a regular basis. So Stevens hot plug stress test script usually stopped working after 10 minutes. Yeah, it depends on the machine. So I had a machine where it was reliably after 10 minutes, max. So yeah, so so there, there's still some of the locked app uh, warnings are still um, uh, existing. One, uh, uh, what, the one is the the, um, the one in the watchdog. Which, which uh, was another interesting experience uh, when the, the lock app complained about the watchdog locks uh, and our watchdog hot block locking being completely screwed, and it was. I tried to look into that. And said, wow, that's interesting code. So what I discovered was about 10 layers of duct tape to fix a very, very simple uh, underlying root cause, which was basically that a user space procfs interface was writing into a variable which was used by the kernel live. And then they dealt with all the race conditions in there. And it was about 12 patches stacked on each other. And all the patches did was voodoo programming to make the race window small enough that it can't be observed anymore. Instead of simply going there, create a shadow variable in which the user space writes into and then do a synchronized update from a, from a known state, which avoids all that uh, trouble. So unfortunately, we had a testing failure there. Uh, I wanted to get it late into, into RC1, but then it failed testing, and uh, we had to postpone it. Yeah, Ben? So I assume these uh, locking bugs affect the regular kernel, not just RT. Yeah, I mean, I mean, these these hot plug locking bugs basically have been there forever. So it's, uh, but it's it's pretty hard to backport the fixes. So because you would have to to backport the the per CPU reader via the semaphore conversion in the first place, and then you, have, you would have to fix up all the different fallouts, which are probably very, very different in all the kernels. Some of them are pretty, pretty straightforward, but then uh, we had to rewrite quite some of the k code, the tracer interaction proof, uh, which is not, was not a pretty exercise. Stephen was helping with that, you know, you know what I mean. So, uh, it's, so the curing of those problems is mostly finished by now. There are some uh, things still being discussed, uh, how to solve them. We have a solution for the, for the uh, watchdog thingy, and there's, I think, one particular problem somewhere in the memory management code where it's still uh, discuss whether they fix it left or right. I don't know. So, but it's, it's covered. Um, so let's talk a little bit about lessons learned. So one thing I found out, if you unearth existing bugs, you are expected to fix them. So when we found the first bugs in the, in the hot block notifier callbacks. We pointed some of them out to the maintainers because we weren't entirely sure how to deal with them. That was completely ignored. Because uh, it looked like, okay, we used this code for five years now, and it never exploded, so it must be correct. Yeah, so we went and fixed it. 
uh, got occasionally the feedback that the fix is wrong, and then after sending patches, the maintenance actually cleared. The amount of crap you find is immense. That's really amazing. So at times it gets rather frustrating to look into that and say, well, is there some proper engineering in the kernel or are we just tinkering? And when you think you saw the worst thing already, no, it's getting worse next week. So yeah, I, I really expected that I saw most of the shit and then the watchdog thing came, came along and that really drove me nuts. Um, so one thing you have to, to learn is to be patient and to just go through. Don't give up if you have to rewrite stuff all over the place. You start off with a, with a very, very single, simple fix and then you look at it and say, no, this doesn't work that way. You end up with a patch series with 20, 25 patches just for a single, for a single driver or a single uh, a facility instance like the watchdog code, which is not that big. It's a thousand lines code base. Um, and the other thing is, which I learned in 2012 once more, I mean, I knew it before, but you always, you know, hope dies last, but never expect that corporate, corporates keep their promises. So that was the hot plug thing. Uh, what other thing we learned out of that, that estimation of effort on such a rework is extremely hard. Uh, we did some, because in course of the, the real-time funding project, we have to do some uh, timelines and uh, milestones and whatever uh, managers expect for their money. So we had a time span and, uh, and the total work hours expected and the time uh, expectation was off by factor two, the work hours by factor three. So because you can not, if you start looking at it from a high level, you just can estimate things, but you cannot see how deep the shit is in, in which you're going to walk. Did you not do the normal estimation, figure out the best estimation, and then multiply by two, then up it maximum? Yeah, we did. <laughs> And we still were off. So just that you get a, uh, a slight feeling for how big of a task that is. It took two years in time span. That was not really uh, every workday worked on it. But we spent about a total of two man years effort on it, and which resulted in uh, roughly 1.2 patches per workday in those two years. So it's a total of something like 500 patches covering that whole thing. That's fun. <laughs> so one other thing where we did a, a big refactoring in, in the last couple of years was the timer wheel. That has an it's a totally different thing from, from, from the refactoring aspect because there's not a widespread, convoluted um, co uh, no, uh, notifier chain or something like that. It's mostly core code. It's confined. It has well-defined or more or less well-defined uh, APIs for, for the various users in the kernel. Uh, the base concept was implemented in 1997, and it was still this, more or less the same when we, when we looked at it a year ago. Um, it was a, of course, it was extended and adopted over time for various extras, uh, per CPU NAS, um, power management, uh, awareness, and things like that. But the basic concept and the basic problems of the timer wheel we're always the same. So that was interesting to go back in time until 1997, read the paper, which was the base for the implementation, actually look at it, why it was implemented exactly that way, and then figure out what could be done, uh, what could be changed, what could be done better. Um, 
And the problem there is if you go back in time uh, over 20 years, you won't find anyone who remembers anything. Everybody is in denial even if they know. Uh, so you have to figure it out yourself. Uh, initially, the timer wheel was used in the kernel for all sorts of timers, for timeouts, for timers. It, it drove all user space interfaces like NanoSleep or Paul Select, whatever. Um, this changed around 2005 when we introduced the high resolution timer um, infrastructure in the kernel and converted the user space facing interfaces all over to that. So, Starting from that time, um, the timer wheel was mostly about timeouts, except for a few use cases where you have a very, very short um, expiry time, which, was, uh, used, is, which is still used in networking for um, uh, time-driven transmissions and things like that. But the vast majority of, of the timer wheel timers actually are timeouts to, capture, to catch exceptions. So TCP act timeout, whatever, uh, disk I.O. timeouts and whatever uh, things you want to, to monitor for exceeding their uh, deadline or timeline. Um, these timeouts have an interesting property. Roughly nine, in, in a lot of workloads, roughly 99% of that timeouts never fire. So that means the, timer, the timers get canceled before expiry. Now, this wouldn't be that bad, but the timer wheel has one property, it's called cascading. So basically what the wheel is, it's, a, it's an array of wheels. So the first wheel, you insert timer with thick granularity, so the maximum time span you get out is 256 chiffies. If you have timers with longer uh, expiry times, which most, many of the timeouts have, you go into the next wheel, which has um, a granularity of the first, uh, the capacity of the, of the next wheel, that means that was, I think it was 64 uh, hash entries. Uh, so you get <coughs> 64 chiffies per entry capacity. Now if the lat wheel go, turns around and you take the bucket, the whole bucket, and cascade it into the first wheel for, uh, for accurate expiry. So if you have Tons of network connections on the flight. Uh, this is amazing how many timers are queued. I thankfully got numbers from Facebook and Google uh, uh, with trace points where I could see actually how many timers were on flight and how many timers were recascaded for nothing. Because in those workloads, 99 point something uh, percent of those timers were uh, were cancelled after recascading. So we were, and the recascading thing is bad because it happens with interrupts disabled and the timer base spin lock held. So occasionally we saw in the traces 8,000 timers being recascaded in one go. You touch 8,000 uh, cache lines. You keep for that operation a spin lock held and interrupts disabled. So that's huge. And it's really pain for nothing. I mean, you recascade the thing into the, to, into the precise expiry bucket in order to cancel it five milliseconds later. That doesn't make sense. The accuracy itself was already blurry in the timer wheel because the power management people tried to batch timer expiry. That means the further away uh, the expiry time went, they tried to collapse them into one, buck, into one expiring bucket. So it was already not a precise expiry 
experience, except for the first uh, for old timers which fit in the first wheel. Uh, <coughs> one of the problems with the power management stuff is when you want to do no hertz idle, which means you don't want to wake up the system because it's just to figure out that it has nothing to do. So you have to search for the first expiring timer, but in the cascading wheel, you actually have a worst case traversal of all, all wheel buckets. And then you have to look in the, in the, in the outer wheel buckets, in the, in the less granular ones, you have to look at every timer, which is the first one to expire which can take a long time if you have thousands, hundred thousand timers queued. Um, and there was uh, interesting undocumented optimizations in there. So we figured out how they work, why they were, have been put there. Some of them were really just, uh, yeah, voodoo. If you looked at it, it never worked, but it sounded good took code and a, and, a, and a nice comment which didn't make sense. So this was a pretty smooth thing. Uh, we spent about three months time for analyzing that stuff that was mostly done with tracing, that was mostly uh, by looking at the code, figuring out how, uh, what the use case is uh, for the timers or how many of those really uh, expect precise expiry. Uh, we did a two months design and proof of concept phase where we um, implemented uh, different versions of, of the final one uh, just to see how it behaves. And then uh, we had a month of final implementation, uh, posting and review process. Ben. Mike. Would it make sense to move over anything that requires price size expiry to the HR timers? It would make sense, but in some cases it's really bad because um, the overhead of HR timers is uh, higher than the timer will timers. So for, for the high frequency networking stuff where you just want to um, uh, push out packets, uh, let's say in a, in a five millisecond rate, you're better off using the timer wheel than the HR timers because the overhead is lay, way, way, way smaller. The, the reason is because the timer wheel is just a one insertion uh, and, and removal. On the on HR timers, we have an RB tree. So you get the overhead of the RB tree and the overhead of programming the actual um, timer hardware, while on the, on the timer wheel, we just pick it back on the tick. So, but if you really, really want to be precise, yes, HR timers is the right thing to use, but it's not true for high performance use cases in under all circumstances, so you have to look at it. If you have stuff which is far enough, enough out, which means it's well, it has long expiry times and he needs to be precise, then yes, go for HR timers because that's not a high frequent event. It, you do it once in a while so the overhead is just noise. But for stuff which goes rapid, you might want to go to timers, uh, uh, to HR timers because that's uh, more, uh, more efficient. So that's the reason why networking still uses it. So we have a few enhancements on top of that. There's uh, some crap in there uh, which tries to uh, crystal ball the best CPU to place a timer on at the time the timer is started. The algorithm is place it on the CPU which is busiest at the moment. Uh, that's power saving voodoo because that way you know exactly that it's going to expire on the busiest CPU five minutes from now. Mm, no, doesn't work. It kind of works, but it's crap. Because uh, again, you know, most of those timers are, expired, uh, are canceled before expiry. So why would you do an extensive look up and figuring out where to, where to place it when you start it. 
So what we, what we are currently working on is basically doing it the other way around. Always queue it in the local CPU, be fast, but queue it into a different array. And in, in case your CPU goes idle, it tells the other CPUs in a, in a, tree, in a tree fashion, hey, I have timers to expire, please care, I go idle. So if it gets canceled, nothing happens. If it really, really expires, then somebody else who's actually busy can grab it from there, pull it over, and, and run the expiry function. That makes a lot, of more, a lot more sense than doing it, it the other way around on every insertion time. Uh, do a magic voodoo lookup, which is uh, wrong in 50, at least 50% of the cases. Um, was it success? Yes, it was a pretty smooth conversion. There was minimal fallout. Famous last words. Last week, more than a year after uh, the stuff got merged, we got a user space visible regression report that, uh, which is still not resolved uh, because there's a discussion ongoing. Um, the proper resolution, the proper uh, solution would be to convert that particular timer uh, to a HR timer, but the networking folks are um, arguing about that. So the, the, the ironic thing there is uh, some of the networking folks, oh, we should revert that timer wheel stuff. I said, yes, we can do that. The, uh, the subsystem which go is going to pay the biggest performance price for that is going to be networking. It's a fun discussion. It's still going on. Uh, it went silent a few days ago. I don't know what they are cooking now. Pardon? Yeah. So the lessons learned here are quite different. Uh, be prepared to do paleontological research. So this is really time consuming because there's a lot of non-existing information out there or actually the information is existing but it's hard to find and hard to link to something. So there's, there's a, a few interesting projects out, out there which try to, to map tokens in the, in the code to, to actual discussions on mailing lists. That would have been really, really useful to have for that kind of work. Um, so don't expect that anyone knows anything. Everyone I asked said, I don't know. I forgot all of that. Uh, they just want, not wanted to be dragged into that anymore. Um, don't expect that anyone cares. Um, yes, um, that's, but that's a general true observation. If you do stuff in the core, most people just do not care. You, tell, you ask them nicely, please test that. If there is, is that a problem for your subsystem? Is there anything we overlooked when analyzing the stuff? Oh yeah, it works. A year later, hey, can we revert that? Yeah, okay. So be prepared for the late surprises. That's, that's really important, but you can deal with that. To what extent are the git logs useful? Of course, if it's really old codes, then there isn't any, but from the time that git was used, how useful are they? Mm. Yeah, okay, so we can throw that around. Um, the git logs are partially use, useful. Uh, it's getting better over the last five years, but up to that point, change logs are lousy in general. So the vast majority of change logs is crap. Uh, it's fix bug. Uh, and you use, and then if it has a sentence in that, that sentence is, describes what the patch is doing, not why it is doing. And that's something I, I spend an awful amount of time on as a maintainer to educate people to write proper change logs or I end up writing them myself. Statistically, I probably rewrite every second change log. 
just because change logs may have to make sense. And actually, often enough, if you do a single line bug fix, it's harder to write the change log in a way people can understand it than actually coming up with the patch. It takes more time. But it should be done because if you look at the change two years later, you say, what the hell? And if you do not have the context of the change logs explaining why this was done, it's really, really hard to figure out. Uh, but that's independent of the time of wheel code base. It's, it's a general observation. So handy tools, git grab, git lock, git blame. I use the history git tree a lot for that kind of work. There are two actually. One, one is the BitKeeper history, which I converted into Git, which is actually a one-to-one -one, uh, mirror of the Git, uh, BitKeeper history with all the branches and everything, so it's really accurate. And then there's the very the really ancient uh, history tree, which basically uh, imported the, the, the Delta patches from one uh, uh, version to the next version. And uh, some of them are missing, so it's... it's, it's and of course, it completely lacks change logs. It's, just um, mostly contains uh, Linux release mails, which are sparse at best. So we added a new architecture. We fixed some bugs here and fixed some bugs there, and we got five now drivers. That's it. New release. Have fun. <coughs> so, pun. Pun. The big keeper uh, is on on kernel org. It's a. Uh, um, pub, SCM, whatever, where the other Git trees or tglxhistory.git. That's actually one of, uh, one of the frequently used ones, according to the kernel org maintainers uh, or admins. They so one, one other tool I use a lot for this kind of work is Cochinelle. So Julia is not here, but she will be on Friday. Thanks for that. That's a really awful thing. It's great. You know it. Uh, if, you, if we want to figure out what piece of code touches a particular pack, uh, um, data structure or fills, with, uh, fills in some, uh, some member of a data structure, you can use Cochinel to do that, and it's really, really, really helpful. Uh, Cochinel is nice because you can do grabs. You can also create patches with Cochinel. But uh, I'll often use the, grab fun uh, the, 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 the search functionality because Cochinelli understands C, so you can uh, create rules. Um, the, the, the real bad part about Cochinelli, if you don't use it on a daily basis, you have to page in the semantics of, of the, of the Cochinelli scripts every freaking time, and you end up banging your head on the wall. Um, and the worst case, what can happen, something doesn't really work, you go, uh, either to the mailing list or the IRC channel, poke Julia gently. She comes immediately up with a proper solution for your problem. And then occasionally it happened that she said, no, this doesn't work. Why? Half an hour later or a day later, you got a patch for, Cochin for the underlying OCaml code of Cochinel. And, um, at some point, she fat fingered it, and then she was not around, and I had to actually do Orcaml myself. That was painful. No, it's a, it's a nice language. It's a nice language. I, in general, I love functional languages. I do list programming occasionally, but Orcaml is harder. Um, mail archives are useful as far as they exist uh, or are searchable. Some of them are really badly searchable. Um, IRC and email, of course, uh, so the, both have partially defects in ignorance and um, lag. And one of my favorite tools for big refactoring uh, and, and keeping big, big patch queues uh, under control is Quilt. And of course, one of the real important tools is a good espresso machine. I never, I never use cross-reference. No, that that requires to use a browser, and that's bad. 
So you can use tags. Tags and a proper editor, which supports it. I think both uh, debatable editors support tags. Uh, let's not go there. I omitted it from here. Even if I can't do stuff in Wim, which I can do in Emacs. But the only reason why I can do it in Emacs because I hacked the Lisp code myself. So, recommended for you. Yes, but not if you're faint-hearted. You really have to be stubborn to do that. Um, you have to be aware that you're going to dig into all sorts of dark and evil places. But on the other hand, you learn a lot about kernel history. You learn a lot about the concepts in the kernel. You figure out why things which do not make sense at all are the way they are because some of them are historically grown and just workarounds about around the fact that nobody wanted to change the underlying infrastructure. Um, you get used to figure out and understand undocumented code from vanished authors. So if you, in some of the parts we looked at, we tried to contact the authors because we couldn't for the hell figure out in a, in a short time frame uh, what why that code was written that way and what it was supposed to do. Uh, but either the email address is bounced or they never come back to, came back to us. So you are then back on your own and can just try to make sense out of it. It's not pretty often enough, but it works. Um, and one thing uh, you really need to have a strong back for is to fight the it has worked well until now mentality. So uh, even if you can um, technically explain that there is a bug, people come back to you and say uh, straight in, into your face, we never trigger that, so it's a non-issue. That's really an annoying habit. I don't want to point out particular persons, but I want to point out that this kind of mentality is very widespread in big corporates. That's uh, just an observation. No, no scientific proof for that. So, but uh, one thing you figure out after you've gone through something like that is you can prove that this industry just works by chance, <laughs> not by design. Uh, is it fun? Yes, it is fun, at least by some definition of fun. And with that, I'm giving you the chance to ask questions. No questions. Want to refactor the VFS? <laughs> I certainly don't want to do that, but I can tell you how to do that. <laughs> I've got 20 other people who can tell me how to do it. <laughs> so, some, somebody had a go at the TTY layer a while ago, and it sort of was half done. I am not entirely sure that the end result is any better than what was there before. Uh, at least in terms of races and dodgy looking. Yeah, yeah, the pro yeah, um, the, the the work on the TTY layer was done when we removed the big kernel lock, um, and as in general with the big kernel lock, nobody actually knew anymore what it was protecting. <laughs> but in most of the cases, it was rather straightforward to to solve that except for the TTY layer. Once we removed the big kernel lock, it fell apart and didn't work anymore and nobody was able to figure it out or nobody was actually masochistic enough to figure it out. Alan Cox had a few steps on that and he did some of most of the uh, BKL removal in the TTY layer. He actually cleaned up quite some of the uh, crap there. But Somebody more recently had a dab at it and actually created more races, I think, than, than he fixed. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, that, that's one of the obscurest parts of the kernel, and uh, I never dared to go there. Maybe I do that when I'm going to retire and give up on the other stuff. <laughs> then I have enough time to do that. Any other questions? Uh, any hindsights on, and insights, really, on getting people to write proper change logs? Because I try and I fail to get people to improve. Uh, it, it sometimes works. So oh, my experience is that if you explain them over time, they improve, some of them. I mean you have to accept the fact that a lot of people are completely advisory resistant. That's encouraging, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. Yeah, the problem, the problem is, the, the problem is if they fix a bug. So you, you have a bad argument to, to uh, so Greg said he's rejecting uh, patches with bad change logs. Yeah, that's one. Th uh, I do that occasionally too, and try to uh, help them along with writing it correctly. But um, at some point, you give up. So, more? No. Thank you.